welcome to another episode. Here we are again with Naya and Slavic. If you miss them, these persons have managed over a thousand essays together. So you should go to the first episode we did last week and see what they are, who they where they come from, how they met, and how they end up with a book about the future essays and what is the role and how generative AI will impact. Do they need to open a bakery or are they <laughs> <they're laughs> safe for the next years? So that's the questions we answer in the first episode together. How are you doing? Good, very happy to be here. Again. Good, happy to be here, still not opening the bakery, although not a bad idea. <laughs> Good, yeah, that's always my dream. I always say, uh, when, whenever I get bored of this, I will open a bakery. A bakery. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It doesn't sound relaxing at all. <laughs> it's waking up too early, I think. I <laughs> yeah, and it's a stressful work, but I love bread. But yeah, in this second part, I want to talk with you about the dimensions of what is to be an essay, because that's a big part of your book. You cover all the different hats that essays need to wear in the different roles, and I imagine in different levels of their careers, and coming from all these thousand people that you have managed, and the hundreds that you have interviewed for your book, it will help the people watching to understand a little bit more of this role. Can you give us like a little summary of what these roles are? So then we can dive uh, into each individual one. Uh, do you want to start? Uh, yes. So we have different roles in the solutions architect. Uh, one of the uh, very important ones is uh, to be a customer advisor. We work very close with the customers to 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 do, to do that and they're like account essays that work specifically for one customer for a set of customers and their focus is like to to focus on, on giving them the, the the solutions that make sense to to address their business uh, challenges and when we talk about essays in this video and in your book are you talking about aws solution architects or this will apply to any solution architects working in consultancy or internally or in different roles different companies so we are working about the aws so i've been solutions architect also in other companies and the role is quite different so I think, I don't know, maybe I, there are other companies out there that the role is very similar, but I didn't meet those yet. So the solution architect has this part of the customer advisor, thought leadership. We work super close with the service teams. We do a lot of things for mentoring. It's a bit uh, different. Like, Slavic, what, what do you think? Yeah, I agree with Naya. I think it's the definition in our book is specific to AWS, which is not to say that there aren't other companies which may have similar roles, but I wouldn't assume that it's universal. I wouldn't assume that all roles that have solution architect in their title are the same. This is specific to AWS. Yes, that's good for me to clarify because maybe the people watching are working in some consultancy and they have the title solution architects and they're like, I don't do anything like this. In any way, we thought this can also inspire other people with similar roles in the industry to understand better the role at AWS and get some ideas. I will be also happy to hear ideas from others about how to, how these roles could work in other companies. I will be also very curious to know. Yeah, yeah it I may imagine. be helpful. Maybe helpful for those who are technologists, but not customer facing to understand uh, and maybe considering like uh, I did 15 years ago almost that, okay, I've done enough of coding. What is this customer facing aspect of it? So they may be thinking, is this role for me? Is this something I should try? It could also be people with uh, more of a business background, but who have aptitude to learn technology, naturally pick up new technologies uh, quickly, and uh, it's almost technology their hobby, consider, can I do this? Uh, do I have sufficient technical depth? Or it could be those uh, who uh, have customer-facing role in other companies figure out, well, can I, uh, if, if I transfer to Solution Architect in AWS, will I be successful? It could also be helpful to our customers, hopefully some of the audience are technologists that our customers to say, when solution architect from AWS come to me, what should I expect? What kind of people are they? That's a good point. Yeah. In fact, some of the customers are, uh, we have a couple of customers also in, in the book. And one of them was 
discussing this with me to inspire himself on how he's going to run his organization of solutions architects in the customer, which is a total different, it's an in, a different industry, but he was getting some ideas on it. And then others that I always ask, what is to be, a, a say, I think this is the perfect book to read because you have so many anecdotes from, from essays about their daily job and challenges and what works well, what they can do better. So that's also, a, that's really also interesting. Great. Just to clarify, who, what is a solution architect? Because it's such a broad term that it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> so I wanted to yeah, put the yeah. context, who, what we are covering here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think to cover it all, probably best to read the book. But to summarize, solution architect in AWS is a customer-facing technology who helps customer get the most value out of AWS. Or put the other way, who helps customer reach whatever business outcomes they're trying to reach with the help of AWS. So it's, it has to be somebody who is good with technology, who also understands customer problem or is able to understand customer problem, put themselves in the customer's shoes, provide guidance. And uh, the solution architect in AWS, we have several major flavors. One is what Naya said. One is uh, what, what we call account solution architect. That's uh, uh, a solution architect who manage re relationship with customers over the longer term. Then we have specialist solution architect who specialize in particular technology, technical domain, and they assist customers as needed. They come in, help their fellow account as, as solution architects progress a specific problem, a resolve specific problem, and then go back, go help the next customer. And we have also partner solution architects who work with our partners and help partners become uh, more successful buildings a business on AWS, uh, with AWS on AWS. So those are the three major flavors. And then we have many sub flavors, but whatever flavor it is, all solution architects generally focus on several things. One is advising customers. We call it customer advisor. Second is, uh, you can never advise all the customers, right? You will never have enough time. So the, the, therefore, there is a second aspect of what we do, which is we call thought leadership, which is how you reach broader audience, which is basically what you're doing, Marcia. What you're doing, we, we would call in a say world thought leadership, right? You're trying to reach broad audience. You will never have a chance to talk to all these people one-on-one, -on -one, but you try to deliver some message that hopefully will be helpful to them. And then the, the third aspect of what solution architects do is influencing service, in, influencing the direction of our platform, because we are the most forward deployed sort of technic, technical team. We understand, we see how customers use our technology, and we can bring that information back to the service teams and tell them, this is how customers prefer to use it. This is what's working well. This is what should be changed. This is the missing part that you need to prioritize. Yeah, so basically SAs and the A's do more or less the same thing, but in different percentages. I do very little customer advisor, one-to-one, -one, and I do a lot of thought leadership and service teams because I'm a product DA. I work with service teams super closely. So yeah, I can see the the resemblance with the role. What else you you do in there? Because Yes, so there is another um, chapter of the book about the part of uh, developing others, about becoming like a mentor. This is something very Amazonian that we spend some of the time to improve the organization and a great way to improve the teams is like mentoring others. And this is like really part of the, our job, like all of us as mentees and have mentors and, and so on. I've never seen that before. So in fact, for me, it took many years and I was working in different companies until I had a mentor. Uh, and it was for me a mentor, a person that I could rely, that I felt somehow reflected to this person. It will, she will share with me her experiences, give me advice. And for me, it was a game changer. And here it's very good because I see from the very beginning, the people that come here, the junior as well, they are very much yeah, uh, developed uh, together with the team. Everybody feels like responsible because in the end, together we can go right farther. So together, that's why we have a chapter on this part. It's a very yeah. important part of the role. Because in AWS, you, I think it's like juniors essays. What is the name? Associate essay? Associate essays, yeah. That it will be like a junior essay. That is a very weird thing to have a solution architect, like in the mind of, Everybody is like a super senior person that have seen it all. And I think that's a power with mentoring that you can have maybe a person that came out from university that has some technical knowledge and fit them all this experience in by partnering with like people with all this experience so they can move faster 
Um, yes, so one of the things also unique here, and, and we, in the book, we imagine how we'll be with Gen AI, is like our onboarding experience. So we have a couple of months where uh, each person, but this is not only the juniors, also the seniors, they take some time to get trainings to understand the culture. I, I, I always explain that I did a, a training about writing as an Amazonian. That is one of the trainings most useful because I have used it a lot and I give uh, yeah, training that, that must. Uh, so uh, anybody that joins us is going to have a onboarding period and it's going to be assigned an onboarding body. And we were in the book saying, okay, this onboarding body can be up to some point, some Gen AI that, that can help us to, to say these are the trainings and you can do a chat. But what really helps is to have somebody human, right? That that we can uh, feel reflected and helps us in their experience. And sometimes we just want somebody that we feel listen and, uh, and share our struggles. So this part is going to be very important. AI is not going to be able to remove also that part. May augment some things, may automate some things. But uh, having somebody human to be our mentor and to mentor others, I, I think that's uh, quite irreplaceable. Yeah. Yeah, How and, many and hours? specifically for more junior, much, uh, particularly college grads, we have a very extensive program. I would call it Tech U, right? We, it's a very extended boot camp, almost 12 months just learning the basics, then another six to 12 months shadowing and observing more experienced solution architects. It's, it's still relatively new to us. I think we've been practicing, depending on which part of the world you look at, we've been doing it for almost five years. Then the world itself exists for almost 20 years. So it's relatively new and we're still developing it. But we definitely understand that we, when you, when somebody graduates from university, the, they cannot compress that experience. They cannot learn that experience in a year. They cannot learn from the books. The only way to learn it is by partnering with more experienced colleagues, absorbing it through osmosis, trying to take on some of the tasks and learning from failure, but under the guide of somebody more experienced so that the failure doesn't externalize to the customer, but is caught by a teammate and corrected. Uh, and it, it takes some time. I think based on my experience for a college grad, it probably takes two to three years before uh, they, they have sufficient confidence to provide advice on specific topics to a specific uh, customer audience. Not on all topics, not to all customer audience, which is something we would expect of a more senior solution architect. But again, I don't think all solution architects needs to talk to all customers about everything in a 400 level. That's why we have the specialist essays in there to come and help <laughs> the account essays with very nitty gritty details about, I don't know, whatever the customers are doing. And <laughs> You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. The, the platform is so broad and so deep, it is impossible. Although I have to say, we try. When we just started as a AWS, we did try. We only had a one kind of solution architects, but over time we realized it, it, it simply cannot happen. I, I think what is expected of an experienced solution architect is knowing your limits. One of the things that I had to unlearn coming from software development is that when you are in front of the customer, you are the face of AWS and you earn a lot more trust by knowing your limits and saying, I don't know the answer. Let me either go research the answer or bring an expert who understands this technology at the deeper level and we will get you the answer. Whereas a software developer, you usually deal with your peers, so it's okay to brainstorm and figure things out uh, right there on the spot. And I think that's a big difference. In fact, when we interview, and it may be unique to AWS, when we interview candidate solution ar for solution architect role, um, we always look for how, are they aware of their limits? How broad and deep they are on technology, but also are they aware of their limits? Because it would be, it would undermine customer trust if somebody uh, behaves like an LLM, right? If somebody <laughs> just uh, blurts out something that is not true with high confidence. I was thinking exactly that. This you don't want creative AI essays; you want humans. <laughs> no, you absolutely don't, and that's another reason why going back, referring back to our first interview, this is one of the reasons I think solution architects should understand that LLM is not going to replace them anytime soon, but it will help them be more effective uh, because of that understanding of your limits, understanding when to say, I don't know, understanding when to go ask for help. Yeah. I have one question about mentoring and the whole growing career, because I talk with 
for example, a lot of women in tech or trying to get into tech. And for example, I met many ladies coming from the financial sector, either accountants or economists or doing things related to business management and things like that. And they, oh, I would love to be an NSA. We have worked with AWS and I have been like the domain expert or we have been working with consultants. And I, how I can those People become essays without having much technology experience, but we having a very big domain experience in some topic like finances or healthcare or media or retail. So I'm also I'm involved in a lot of diversity attraction uh, initiatives, right? And and usually what I recommend is first of all, like I explain what is the essay role. I really believe we need more diversity. We need like uh, cognitive diversity. We need people that think differently because precisely in these Gen AI times it's even more important because we want to to see the if there are some biases or new ideas. Nothing is going to come super new with it if, in, if you are in a team that everybody thinks the same. So the ideas are much, much better. And then if when somebody asks me, I usually refer to look to one of our certifications because it gives an overall view, like actually part of the onboarding should be getting the Solutions Architect Associate Certification. So look at it. Is this something that you will feel comfortable for the essay role to do? That will be one thing. I also think, as we, we mentioned in the other chapter, that because it's, we are like driving new innovations, like now comes Gen AI, uh, we said, no, you don't have to compete with somebody who has 25 years of experience in Gen AI. So it's actually, I think it's like a good area where you should uh, just go and, and jump to it and get to know. I also recommend like following people like you. I actually recommend you, <laughs> Marcia. And also Fuba and so on to, to get to know more about the technology and about what is to work. And then, yeah, to think we have a lot of initiatives to uh, attract diverse talent. So from people, from young people to others that have gone through a career break. So I will also recommend them to, to look into those programs. Yeah, because sometimes getting the domain knowledge is harder than to get the technology knowledge because technology changes all the time. So as you said, you can jump now and you will learn the experience maybe two years as a associate SA, but you already have 20 years of experience in finance. So then they put you in an account exactly. that is a fine tech and you're like rocking it because you know exactly what they have to do there. <laughs> Exactly. You can really empathize much better with the problems of the industry. So one of the conclusions of the book is also that the industry knowledge is something we need to strengthen and to focus on because we are going to have more use cases. We have this technology, but how it actually becomes like a use case that the, the, the customer needs. Yeah, Yeah. So, I, I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I, I think with that, I think one thing that the uh, essays are, are still the most technical part of our customer facing organization that is inescapable you do need to bring technical expertise to the customer because if you don't there is nobody else in the account team who will do that however we have different team structure and different we we, we could have teams working specifically with to continue with your example finance customers large finance customers usually if it's a large customer we could have a team of multiple solution architects on the team some of them would bring more horizontal technical expertise and some could bring more domain expertise with technology i absolutely agree that now there is going to be more opportunities for people with different backgrounds. However, having said that, because it's a technical role, uh, I use the same approach as Naya suggested. If I'm approached by somebody who is in a career changing mood, who hasn't done technology before, I advise them to, to take the certification before coming for an interview, because it would be a very good sort of way for them to, to validate whether they believe they have the necessary patience and aptitude to learn the technology to the degree that they need to, even if they, they we're not trying to somehow magically for them to uh, learn 25 years of experience that their colleagues will have, but we do want them to have good technical foundation and to good technical grounding. So to me, it's a combination of those two, finding the role where you can play to your strengths, but also acknowledging and embracing the fact that you will need to to have solid technology foundation and using certification as one of the evaluation criteria. 
Yeah, certifications are great because they come with this study plan. So if you don't exactly. know it's like a where to go, you just follow it, get one of it's those courses. It's not that you go to the AWS site and you don't know where to wait. It's a structure, you have questions, so it's good. Yes. So let's go a little bit more in depth into the different uh, roles. We talk about the customer advisor, the thought leaders, and the working with service teams. Maybe we can go to the first one a little bit more. What is the customer advisor? So SAs will spend most of their time as customer advisors. That I imagine is their main purpose or... That's true. That's true. The primary role, and when I help new SAs wrap their head around the role, new to AWS, even if they may be coming from uh, customer-facing roles before, I say that our objective is to drive sustainable adoption of our technology. What I mean by that, drive meaning SAs have to play proactive role. They have to find opportunities to help customers not sit and wait for for somebody to call them to help uh sustainable meaning the customers would need to see genuine benefit from adopting aws right one of the things we really aspire to is that we grow our business because of customer success not at the expense of the customers not because we mislead them into buying something they don't need but because we help them achieve business outcomes be successful and as their workloads build on aws grow so does our business but in order for that to work essays need to understand what customers are trying to accomplish what's the best technical way of doing so like solid technical guidance and also sometimes it, it implies <laughs> helping customers avoid avoid things, not necessarily helping customer adopt things. So to, to your example from our last interview, right? if you ask LLM, it would tell you build it on EC2, but the modern architecture would be built on serverless. And sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes customers say, we're excited by serverless, we want to do it in serverless, but they don't really have the skill set. And so you tell them, okay, serverless is great and it's the right way to go, but it, uh, it's uh, crawl, walk, run maybe first build it on on something that you're more familiar with, but at least it will be in the cloud, then containerize it, then go for serverless. Yeah. I met what do one, you think now? once what a customer that was very confused about our model with the SAIS because he was saying, Yeah, we have this group of SAIS working in our company and they modernize all our infrastructure and now our AWS bill is like 10% of what it was. I don't understand. It's a free service and it saves you money. And I, what is what AWS but is? is <laughs> but this is the, the long-term thinking that I like so much because I've been working in other organizations and I have like people in my network and it's, okay, let's go and just tell them about all this portfolio that we have. Like, to like, and I've been doing that. I've been going to customers like 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I was going, and this is all that we have now. This is, and then you look, in, look at me, like what all I can offer. And now it's totally different. And it's tell me you first, what are your challenges? Uh, and then I will figure out the most optimized way that I can help you to solve this. And I will also even help you to to optimize your costs and and, and yeah, and to, to, to be more efficient. So I'm not trying to go and tell you, look, this is like the portfolio and you can choose so much. And I like it very much. I think it's like we put ourselves on customer shoes really, and we really want to do the best for them. It's long-term thinking, right? Yeah. And that's something very confusing sometimes for organizations that are used on to make money out of our customers. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it, it is interesting that at first customers, some customers who are new to working with AWS, at first they don't even believe it. They believe it too good to be true. Like you, you are actually trying to help me build the most cost efficient architecture. What's wrong with that? Aren't you selling me something? And then, yes, we are, but we want you to be successful with our technology, and that's how we want to grow. And in order for you to be successful, it has to make economic sense. Exactly. So, so let's talk a little bit about the second, the second aspect that is the thought leaders. That's as a DA, that's my biggest box in this the three chapters that are more or less the same. But I would love to see how that evolves in the essays because it's just i imagine it's not the same that you ask from an associate essay from a principal essay 
I don't know, at least from experience, seeing the different essays in the organization, the split of how much customer work they do beside, compared to thought leadership and how they grow internally and externally is very different. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that. As put it very good, like, we cannot have one-to-one -one <laughs> sessions with everybody, right? So this is an opportunity for the sales to scale their knowledge beyond their conversations with their customers. And you will see a lot of essays in like uh, meetups or and I think that's where it comes a bit what you said, Marcia. So it could be like the most junior maybe starts in a local meetup doing the sessions first. And then our most seniors, they go to the States to Las Vegas to reinvent and talking to thousands. There is different ways. And, and there's so many things. The scaling is the thing, right? So it could be also some people may be better at talking. Others, they want to be writing. So then you can do some blog posts. I, I've seen um, successful associates that they are like partnering between some of them to write a blog post. So there are many ways. It's just like uh, the mental model is like scaling your knowledge. Absolutely, absolutely. I think that's the, the, the key motivation for it is understand that you can never reach all the current and potential customers one-on-one. -on -one and figuring out the best way to reach your intended target audience. It could be different formats. It could be different channels. Uh, and I think that's one of the differences. More senior uh, solution architects, we expect uh, them to be more creative in discovering sometimes new formats and new channels. Um, and more junior solution architects assisting in creation of the content. For example, a principal solution architect could determine that for, for example, for, for a new set of services that we're developing, the target audience are developers uh, and developers, like, uh, for example, one of my teams, uh, uh, when I was managing team in Korea, one of the teams was uh, focused specifically on gaming companies. And uh, we, they came up with an idea that game developers are, are on Twitch. Gamers are on Twitch and game developers are on Twitch. And so uh, they created a Twitch channel where they would talk, uh, they would have live shows about how to use AWS effectively when uh, developing games, hosting games. And, and that was very successful because, because it was the format and the channel appropriate for their target audience. So when we talk about solution architect, uh, thought leadership of solution architect, it, it's not, it, the, the main motivation is think of your target audience and it's different for different solution architects. Think of how to best reach the target audience with the message that you need to deliver so that, that they get value. And it could be educating, it could be inspiring. Usually it's one of the two. And it could be your current customers or it could be your prospective customers. Keep all that in, in mind when you when thinking what, what's the best way to reach them. Yeah. And one thing, at least I always encourage essays, at least younger essays, or that they just borrow content from others. Like the content, at least that we produce in AWS is not for the content I do is not my content, it's AWS content. So I'm always happy to give you the slides, give you the repo, just go and deliver it somewhere else in some language, in some place I cannot travel and enjoy it. It's like usually principal solution architects are more like they want to build their own things, but a normal solution architect can deliver most of the talks. If the talks are ready and recorded, they can just say it in their own language, in their own words maybe build their own demo and inspire many people. Uh, so that's my way of doing thought leadership at scale. It's <laughs> letting Absolutely. others reutilize my content, but it's important for them not to build everything. Absolutely. In fact, I think the, the way we encourage solution, if we talk about various sort of stages of expertise or seniority uh, and experience, what we encourage principal solution architects is to think about new channels, new formats, and be more of a, sort of a technical leader, not necessarily developing everything, but identifying what needs to be done, finding people who will partner with you and making sure that the right things are done, developing the most uh, difficult pieces yourself, but for like maybe 10% and 80 to 90% is uh, others that you've uh, encouraged, inspired to partner with you and deliver. And definitely one of the good ways for more junior solution architects to cut their teeth in thought leadership is localization, as you pointed out, absolutely. Translate that blog, 
take those slides and deliver them uh, uh, locally in your meetup, maybe in a different language. Absolutely. Yeah. And another thing, I don't know if it's for a says in thought leadership, but I think it is open source. At least there is a lot of open source projects that have come from AWS, from SAs. I don't know, the power tools for Lambda, that's, I think, is a great example of SAs finding a hard problem, building a tool, building a whole thing. And now they have a team <laughs> that just happened very organically within the organization. And there is many examples like that. Um, absolutely. And I, I think, Marsha, that's one area where I think we could do more. I think we absolutely could do more in contributing to open source. We already are doing, we CSA is doing it, but I think that's one of the less developed uh, channels for us. And we certainly have an opportunity to do more there. That is a very important one, at least for the development community, Agreed. because Agreed. it's very needed. So that's the second hat that the SAs need to wear. <laughs> big one. For those. Yeah, it's a big one. And for the extroverted ones. <laughs> It's something that, that they may enjoy a lot. And the last bit is the working with service teams. That's a very specific, specific thing for AWS, because I think customer advisor and thought leadership is something maybe that fits in many consultancy roles, but working with service teams is something very specific to AWS, what it means for an SA. In the end, other thing that I, I consider very interesting about AWS is that most of our services, like the biggest percentage comes from the innovation, comes from the customer feedback, which is like 90%. a, a very, Ninety percent. Yeah, I was like, I try to say it now. Name, I can say ninety percent. So basically, this means the customer is always no, like a bit like dissatisfied, but in this way, it's never going to say that's enough. It's perfect. <laughs> so we take that feedback and the essays that are having these technical conversations with the customers, we have mechanisms to bring this to the service teams and improve the services. And I think one of the key success from AWS is doing that, like listening to the customer. Yeah, absolutely. I think I, I, I may butcher the quote, but I remember when I was onboarding at Amazon the, and as part of onboarding, there was this quote from Jeff Bezos, which read something like, the customers are always wonderfully dissatisfied. And I think it's a very good quote. It means that there is always opportunity for business to do better. And there is always opportunity to reinvent itself. And I, I, it is important to remember that as a business. And this is why the influencing service team is such an important part of SA role, because we are in the best position to see how our services are actually being used and what where is a good match and where there is a gap and bring that information to the service team. Yeah, and that lies very closely to the customer advisor. If you were not so close to customers, it just exactly. becomes very hard to give this uh, input to service teams because service teams will ask you like why they are asking. Maybe they want to sit with the customers. Sometimes the things that customers ask are very cool, but they're very disruptive of the service. So the project managers are like, ah, <laughs> we never Absolutely. thought that this could be used like this. <laughs> Absolutely. Put yourself in their shoes, right? They have limited team resources and they, they need to figure out, okay, how what should go into this sprint backlog? What should go into next sprint back backlog? And the the... There is so many signals coming from the customer. So one of the things, one of the challenges is now that we have so many solution architects and they work with so many customers is organize those signals. And this is what we would expect from our more senior and principal essays is to help us make sense out of all these signals and identify the patterns so that not only do we tell service teams a whole bunch of data points of this is, these are all ways in which customers would like to use a service or to get value, but here are the main themes. Here's the highest priority. Here's why. Here's what it should look like. Could you use Shurnative AI for doing a lot of that? Not really at this point, no, because you could. Uh, let's put it this way. You could to do the first order custom, first order bit, the clustering, right? But then beyond that, you do need human, human intelligence to understand the relative importance. You need to understand what is on service team plates. You need to understand how disruptive a certain thing is, right? Something can be incremental. Something could be completely disruptive. You also need to understand the intangibles. Okay, this has been mentioned most often, but 
it doesn't necessarily mean this is the most important thing to focus on. So going back to our conversation from previous interview, it's again that augmented essay. I really love that term that Naya coined. You could use Gen AI for the initial part of solving the problem of tackling that sort of noise problem, but then you inevitably need human intelligence on top of it. In our book, we have a, a testimonial from Stefan Christoph who puts it like very, he serves some examples and he says in the end, it's also about humans convincing each other and handling objections. So this needs that human component. And the other is about the industry expertise to much of what you mentioned before. Sometimes the services are done for most of the industries, but then in, in this case, he shared an example that was coming from the media and entertainment industry that they needed, I think, like the, the recognition service to be very so a bit different configured to what is the general purpose. And because he had all this media entertainment context and he knew the customer, he could handle these uh, objections uh, and talk to the service team to get that service with, with that feature. Yeah. And one thing at least that is funny for me or was very confusing for me at the beginning when I showed AWS is that value for the story, the, the anecdota, I don't know how you say it in a Anecdota English. and data, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because when you talk with product managers, they don't care, like you have 10 customers that they want this. They want to know which customer, what is their story, where they are coming from. And here is essays are fundamental because they know the story, they know the need, they know the details and and the PMs that are owning these services really want to know that. So yeah, so those are the three big things, big, big sombreros that Slavic was saying that essays need to wear in their daily basis besides mentoring others and helping others to grow. I think after you work a little bit in AWS, you learn how deeply are our leadership principles. You can hear them through this conversation, the ownership aspect, the customer upset, the learning aspect, everything is super embedded in this, this culture. So at least whenever somebody asks me if Amazon is the right company for me, is look at those leadership principles. And if they resonate with you, most of them, then yes. And don't be afraid with frugality. That doesn't mean that you need to live on rice. Just bought. <laughs> Because that's a scary one for a lot of people. <laughs> but I think it, it's just, and, and I think essays are breathing and living that customer obsession and ownership everywhere where they go. So few last words, what I, we are missing or what you would like to tell the future essays or future AWS essays listening to this conversation. Uh, I, I would Slavic, like to say that you're right. This culture is unique and this role is unusual it's not for everybody it absolutely is something that you have to you have it, it has to feel like a right match so it, it helps to ask yourself two questions first if you have to learn all the time it's not a question whether you can do it but will it energize you or will it drain you of energy yeah. and second question is if you constantly working in a hectic environment, highly ambiguous, which doesn't get any less ambiguous over time, does it energize you as an opportunity to chart your own path or does it overwhelm you as it's too chaotic? I think those are the two main questions besides having uh, the right technical or the main foundation that a person needs to ask themselves to decide if it's the right role for them. Other than that, e we have very good support structure and it's a very fun role and it, the teams are usually very helpful very supportive it's a great place to be for the right people i also think it's very fun so this uh, that's why when i wrote this book i thought it's like a kind of yeah like a love letter to the essay role because it's so good it's so fun. i wanted to, to put it out there and show the people what is i also think it may not be for everybody and we here we also talk about things about the amazon culture and maybe you like that part but you think i don't want to do the solutions architect there are many other roles like that, that, that roles yeah for example fun and maybe the developer maybe evangelist but <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's, I think, uh, more ambiguous than anything because we are so few that there is no career plan for essays. So if you like, if you think you don't have enough ambiguity yeah, in a say like, role, <laughs> consider developer evangelist. Then you can go to the, to the developer. Okay. <laughs> so you see, there's a bit for everybody. 
And I also think that is something that um, it, it's important and it's evolving and we're evolving with it. And if you want to be in a place uh, full of innovation and, and really help to be there where, where, where the change is happening, where the magic is happening, uh, I will welcome like the, the people to, to think about it and, and, uh, and, and consider for themselves. Yes. So we have the link for the book in the description box. So if you want to read more about all these interviews and the stories that Naya and Slavik have collected through the last year, you can check it out there. I don't know if you have other call for actions for our audience. Go on no, I, I would say based on the topic of the book, it's more about figure out how to partner with generative AI to be more effective in whatever role you have because it will affect every every knowledge worker at least yes that's so true so make friends with yep. whatever assistant you use <laughs> exactly exactly i, exactly. I love that term. yes exactly and so thank you very much slavik thank you naya for being here and chatting in this two-part interview if you have not watched the first one i leave it in the description box you can go and check it out there we talk about the generative ai and the future more in details about the book and who are these guests so if you just got here <laughs> and you have not watched that one go and check that one out and with that i say thank you everybody for listening thank you thank you for having us ciao, ciao.